High heat and high winds mean heightened preparations for another year of Arizona wildfires. People need to realize that we're in fire season year round. So don't just think that you have to be careful with fire in summer. Tonight on Arizona Week, we're readying for fires and wondering when the cycle will end. Production of Arizona Week is made possible in part by a grant from the Stonewall Foundation and by the members of Arizona Public Media. Thank you for your continued support. Once again, your moderator, Michael Chiha. Wildfires have swept across more than 34,000 acres in Arizona this spring, an ominous portent for summer as wildlands get drier and hotter. Just this week, four fires consumed 25,000 acres in the state, and they're still burning. Tonight, a look at preparations, forecasts, and the science behind this long cycle of devastation. First, Coronado National Forest's Heidi Schuel who spoke with me in scenic Sabino Canyon. What are our current fire conditions in the Coronado National Forest? Well, right now we are set up to experience a, a above average fire season. Uh, there are a number of factors that are contributing to that. First, we are in an ongoing drought, so conditions are quite dry. Uh, we've seen a few storms come through, which have just brought really very short-term benefits, if any. So, um, where the, the fuels are, are very dry. Additionally, there are a lot of fine fuels such as grasses and so forth that um, are left behind from previous wet monsoon seasons. And, and in places that those didn't burn last year, they are still available. So they have dried out, they're flammable right now. Um, as we proceed into the summer with uh, the heat going up and conditions becoming even drier, then the fuels are going to dry out even more. So we're flammable now and we're looking at it becoming even more so. And are there fire restrictions in place now in the forest? We are currently at the level of fire restrictions where there are no open fires allowed unless you are in a developed site using the pedestal grill or the metal fire ring provided. And no smoking is permitted unless you are in an area that is devoid of all flammable materials for three feet around you. And those could escalate depending on conditions all the way to total restriction, right? Right. It's a succession where we'll go into the least level of closures when conditions warrant. That's where we are now. And then as things become hotter and drier, uh, the next stage would probably be no fires and no smoking. And then areas could be closed. And last year, the forest was closed. So that's a last ditch effort, you know, that's something we really don't want to do unless the risk just becomes too great. What kind of fire activity has there been in the forest so far this year? Well, we are midway into May and we've already had 33 fires for over 8,000 acres. And is that a ahead of average pace? That's more than we would usually see at this time of the year. And you said that the season would be expected to be above average this year. That's your anticipation. What is average? What, what do you mean when you say that? Well, I can just give you a comparison that last year was above average for large fire activity. We saw a number of fires. We saw a number of ignitions that would start and grow to thousands of acres within hours. That's unusual. Also, we had a number of large fires across the Coronado. We had the Horseshoe 2 fire, the Murphy fire, the Monument fire, the Arlene fire. A lot of these fires that grew very large very quickly, that is, is, that's above average. That's not normal fire activity. So are you thinking that we could have devastating fires such as those again this year? We are thinking we could see large fires again this year. Now, the thing that's working in our favor is we're not anticipating the winds that we had last year. Last year we had sustained winds, I believe, through June, and that not only spread fire more quickly, but it also grounded a lot of our aircraft uh, that we were using for suppression purposes, and it would change our strategies. You know, we can't put firefighters in front of a wind-driven fire, so wind really complicates things, and this year it's not predicted to be as bad as it was last year. Speaking of firefighters, what kind of resources are there in place or in preparation for an anticipated above average season? Okay, well we have here across the forest nine fire engines on each of our five ranger districts. We have our Coronado National Forest uh, fire crew, hand crew. Other hand crews are available to us. We have a hot shot crew that's pre-positioned here on one of our ranger districts. Other hot shot crews can be ordered. 
We have an air tanker base set up at Fort Huachuca that we can fly air tankers in and out of. We have eight heavy air tankers that are in the vicinity right now. Uh, they are currently working the fires up north, but should we have an ignition, that's what we refer to as ignition attack when we go to fight it, and that takes priority. Uh, we have a helicopter also that is on the forest and another that's assigned, but it's currently away on a fire. So we are set up pretty well. We do have a lot of resources here, and there are additional resources that we can order if needed. What else is it that the public needs to know about how the Forest Service prepares for fire season and then acts when emergencies occur? Well, the Coronado is in fire season year-round at this point. So we always have our crews and our engines that are out on patrol uh, talking to people. We do fire prevention and education. And uh, then early in the spring, uh, through the winter and the spring, we'll start training up our firefighters, bringing our seasonals on. We will bring on additional resources, such as the helicopters. They are just here for fire season. Um, everybody will be trained up and positioned and out patrolling. Then when an ignition is detected, we go into what's called initial attack. And our near, nearest resources will um, go and try to suppress the fire. They'll call in what additional resources they need. Often these will be some of our partnering fire departments, our local and municipal fire departments. If they need air resources, then they will order those up as well. So we'll give it what we think is needed and hopefully catch it while it's small. Uh, the Forest Service puts out about 98% of our fires in initial attack when keeps them small, keeps the costs down. Now, this isn't always possible, especially in some of these really dry desert conditions. And then you add a little wind and turn up the heat and turn down the humidity, and that complicates things even more. Uh, also with that Coronado National Forest, a lot of our terrain is very, very steep, which affects both fire behavior and what firefighters can actually do in aircraft, how effective the aircraft can be. So there's a lot of things that go into what happens and how successful we are. Now, not all fires can be prevented because, of course, we have lightning and natural causes, but human-caused fires can be prevented. What do you say to the public to help us live up to Smokey Bear's admonition that only you can prevent wildfires? Well, people need to realize that we're in fire season year-round. So don't just think that you have to be careful with fire in summer. You know, if you're always thinking about this, fire safety, if it's always for, at the forefront, then that's how you're going to behave. And, and we encourage people always, know before you go. If an area is in fire restrictions, know what they are, and please, please pay attention. They're there for a reason. If it's windy, if it's a windy day, do you really need a fire? You know, don't have one if you don't need one. And really important, never leave a fire unattended. State lands in Arizona are also under restrictions. Here to discuss them is Gene Bodwin, Tucson District Forester in the State Forestry Division. Welcome. Thank you. You just put restrictions into effect statewide as of today. Can you tell us what those are about? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, statewide, uh, the restrictions are no open uh, campfires, uh, no charcoal burning devices of any sort on state lands, as well as uh, acetylene torches or any other type of open flame torches are not allowed on state lands. Uh, that goes to say there are no fireworks allowed on state trust lands. And that's all kinds of state lands. Uh, Parks, uh, uh, roadside correct. medians, etc. Right, state, state trust lands, uh, state parks, uh, the uh, game and fish uh, wildlife areas, as well as the right-of-ways for ADOT. Now, uh, the conditions out there are pretty evident to everyone, but could you talk a little bit about what led the state to make this decision to put these restrictions in now? Uh, a lot of it was the lack of moisture throughout the winter. Uh, as well as uh, the growth they had last year. Uh, between the two of the, uh, those combinations there uh, led to uh, us determining that it was extremely dry out there and the fuels are extremely brittle, really. You know, it's like cornflakes out, of, out there, the grass is. So uh, it wouldn't take very much to spark a fire. Now, do you and, and others in the, the forestry division go out in the field to make these assessments and then bring the information back? Well, we do. Uh, we don't have the uh, scientific uh, data that the Forest Service does as far as uh, gaining fuel moistures and things like that, but uh, we go out and make visual uh, contacts. I have people in the field 
on a daily basis, and I can gather that information from them. And what's the state's expectation or prediction, if you will, for what the fire season will be like this year? Uh, the way things are lining up, it's going to be uh, very similar to last year, uh, unless uh, people are extremely careful with uh, what they do out in the in the forest and in the on the state trust lands. Now, a lot of folks are familiar with state parks and they're familiar with federal and national forests and national parks, but they may not be familiar with other aspects of state lands, state trust lands, etc. What kind of terrain are we talking about here? Grasslands, chaparral, pine, every, uh, everything? Down, down in the Tucson area, we're, we're talking mainly in the lower elevation grasslands uh, up to uh, and including maybe the oak woodlands. Uh, you get up into uh, the Phoenix area as you go north, uh, there are areas of uh, ponderosa pine uh, on state trust lands, as well as up in the Flagstaff area, there's quite a bit of uh, ponderosa pine forest on state trust lands up there. Now, what kind of uh, preparations are underway and training underway for fire crews to respond to any fires that occur on these state lands? Well, training occurs during the winter. Uh, when our fire season is ultimately over, say, around the end of September, beginning of October, we start training our uh, our people again, uh, putting them through refresher trainings as well as uh, new people coming on board, going through the basic wildland. And uh, everyone, every wildland firefighter that is, quote, red carded uh, for the state has to have an eight hour refresher every year. And what kind of equipment is there? Uh, are there aircraft, uh, trucks, pumpers, etc.? Well, the governor signed our severity budget uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and uh, we have brought on aircraft uh, for the state. Uh, we have a couple of single engine air takers down in the Tucson area. Uh, one right now is over in the Wilcox area, as well as an air, air attack platform. And uh, we are hoping to bring a second single engine air tanker on over in the Marana area. Uh, right now, uh, I can't speak for the Phoenix district. I'm not sure what they have as far as air attack in uh, seats up in that area. And uh, do you feel that you're ready for fires uh, when they occur? Uh, we, we feel we are. Uh, we uh, have cooperative agreements set up with all of our fire departments throughout the state. And uh, they are our, resp our first responders. To wildland fires uh, and uh, uh, with them uh, on board we have uh, well over a couple hundred fire departments in the state that uh, are on board as cooperators with us. And then are there cooperative agreements also with federal agencies? Uh, there are intergovernmental agreements with federal agencies so that we can uh, cross border and help each other. And how do those work out? I, I assume that there's lots of cooperation when there's an emergency. Uh, there is. There is a lot of cooperation between us. Uh, I am constantly down at the office with the Forest Service or Bureau of Man Management or uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs talking with them about uh, uh, how we can uh, serve each other better. And uh, we have just a few seconds remaining, and I want to ask you, we're reminding people with this program that they have to be careful with fire out there. What one thing would you say to the public about what they can do to prevent fires? Read these uh, restrictions and take them to heart and follow them word for word. And we will put a copy of the restrictions and a link to the document that lists the restrictions on our website. Uh, azweek.com so folks can look that up. That would be great. Gene Bodwin of the uh, State Forestry Division, thanks so much for speaking with me. Thank you for having me, Michael. Wildfires have been part of Arizona's landscape for time immemorial, and that has allowed study of causes, effects, and prevention. Joining us to discuss long-term conditions is Donald Falk of the University of Arizona School of Natural Resources and the Environment. Welcome to Arizona Week. Michael, happy to be here. The current cycle that we're in of, of dryness or even drought, any signs of uh, change in that anytime soon? 
So climate is a big driver of fire regimes all over the world, and especially here in the Southwest, where we're always somewhat water limited. And so it is true, we're in an extended dry phase of climate um, that probably is going to go on for some decades with some variation. But let, we have to remember that on top of that variation, which has occurred historically, we are also warming the planet. And so the variations are revolving around a higher mean. And so that may mean that we have longer fire seasons, even as we come out of the current warm, warm phase. Now, in your study of tree rings, uh, does that show any periods in the past that have been like what we're experiencing now? Yes, yeah, so we can see in the tree ring record in the southwest um, periods in the past that are similar to today, although no period climatically is exactly the same. The 1950s, of course, a historical drought was a very deep drought that caused a lot of mortality, not necessarily known for big fires. Before that, we go back to the 1580s and 1590s in the southwest when there was a, a very, very long-lasting drought. It lasted several decades and was very deep and hot, and that, we believe, caused a lot of mortality. Prior to that, we see episodic droughts happening every 500 to 1,000 years. And so drought is definitely part of the cycle of climate in the southwest. So we have that history and we have recent history, which in the last decade or so shows, shows, shows tremendous dryness and a lot of devastating fires here in the southwest. Are we learning any lessons from this? Well, as far as climate, it's interesting to look at two sides of climate. Dry climate means that such fuel as there is on the landscape is likely to be more flammable. On the other hand, most plants don't grow as well when the climate is dry, and so we actually have lower fuel production. So a dry period is kind of a double-edged sword. It means that fire danger may be increased for one reason, but the long-term productivity of the ecosystem may be lower. And are we applying any of those lessons? How are we applying any lessons we've learned from what's been happening? Right. So it's an interesting question, and people ask all the time. We're spending a billion and a half dollars every year <clears throat> to try to manage or suppress fire, and that doesn't even count insurance losses, lost productivity, many, many other costs associated with big wildfires. And so the question is, why does this keep happening? What are we doing wrong? A good way to think about that is to go back to first principles in fire ecology and ask, well, what, what is the basis of fire as an ecosystem process? So let's think about the millions of watts of solar energy that are striking the land surface every day. Of that, about 1% is captured by vegetation and transformed into living plant material. Now, what happens to that plant material? Well, basically four things. It stays around on the landscape and grows or stays as a, as a dead wood or a snag. It can be eaten by an herbivore, including insects. It can decompose or it can burn. Those are pretty much the four pathways that we have for vegetation. And if we are in a dry climate, we don't have much decomposition. There are about as many animals out grazing as there ever have been, except for some periods. And so really, fire is nature's way of balancing this equation um, to reduce the amount of excess energy that is embodied in our ecosystems. Now, we know that the human factor is a big one in uh, forest ecology and in the whole wildfire scheme. Uh, and in your case, you and a, a group of people are introducing some kind of human management approach called Firescape. Would you tell us a little bit what, about what that is? Right. So Firescape is a very ambitious program tailored to the needs of ecosystems here in our sky islands in southern Arizona and northern Mexico. And we are trying here to reintroduce fire in the, the role that it plays to maintain equilibrium in ecosystems. We kind of tend to think these days of fire as being these big, devastating, catastrophic events that cause a complete reorganization, and in many cases, really a lot of destruction of ecosystems. But fire has, also has this other role when in another manifestation in which it helps to maintain productivity, it maintains lower stand densities, that means fewer trees per acre, and fire also can play this very, very positive role. It helps to cycle nutrients. It, it can be a very positive force. And so the focus of Firescape is to get ecosystems in the Sky Islands back to the point where fire can play this natural, positive role rather than being the destructive force that we think of. And are you seeing any results yet, or is it too soon? No, it's not too soon. There are ecosystem management projects going in in the Pinaleños and the Huachucas, um, some very, very forward-thinking 
proposals that involve essentially restoring entire mountain ranges. And this is something that has really never been done anywhere in the United States. And of course, the Sky Islands are ideally suited to that approach because they are these islands of, of forest. We also have the fires that have occurred in the Chiricahuas, for example, Horseshoe 2 fire and the fire, the monument fire last year in the Huachucas. Well, those were unplanned events, but they did a lot of ecological work, and so they leave a legacy that managers can work with to move forward. You sound hopeful about it, and we have just about 30 seconds remaining in that time. Tell me a little bit about your hopes, but also what the barriers might be here. Right. Well, we have a fire problem. We also have a land use problem, and this is true all over the West. Many of the fires, including some of the fires that are burning in Arizona today and the Los Contras fire last year, were very much influenced by land use, and that means people and values and property that have to be protected. So a lot of what we do in managing fire moving forward is actually managing how human beings live on the land, and that's got to be part of the solution. Donald Falk, University of Arizona scientist from the School of Natural Resources and the Environment, thanks for speaking with me. My pleasure. Thank you. Joining me now via satellite from Phoenix is Sean McKinnon, who covers the environment for the Arizona Republic. Welcome back to the program, Sean. Thanks. Uh, officials in southern Arizona are predicting a big wildfire season again this year. What are you hearing in other parts of the state? Same thing? Yes, the, the wildfire potential is high in almost every part of the state. And, and you can see just with the fires that have started uh, already, the one up uh, near Crown King, uh, the one over uh, the Sunflower Fire, even a fire burning in some of the areas where the Rodeo Chetuskai Fire burned about 10 years ago. So the potential is high pretty much everywhere. And you reported in your blog for the Arizona Republic, Water Blogged, that drought conditions are getting worse in the state. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, we had uh, a drier than average winter. We had snowfall uh, in pretty good amounts early on, and then it was like a switch flipped, and we didn't get very much. And so in the end, the, the snowpack was below average. The runoff was below average. Uh, in fact, in some areas, the, the runoff was, was down around 40% of the long-term average. And because it melted so fast, the snow, uh, we're already seeing the soil drying up, which is why we've got the dry conditions out on the ranges and, and in the forests right now. So right, right now, the entire state is either abnormally dry or in some level of drought. Now, we've been in these drought conditions for quite a while, and there are a number of programs underway to try to ameliorate the effects of it in the forests and reduce fuels, et cetera. One of them here in Arizona is the Four Forests Program. Would you first of all explain for our viewers what that is, and then I'm going to ask you how it's working. The Four Forests Initiative is a, a partnership between state and federal agencies, as well as uh, some nonprofit organizations and uh, private industry. And the goal of it is to uh, treat or thin about 2.4 million acres of our forests uh, over the next 20 years. And, uh, and that means removing some of the trees that uh, are in these forests now, uh, in some cases returning fire in a, in a more controlled way, uh, with the ultimate goal being to return the forests closer to what they really should be. Most of our forests are very overgrown right now, and which is the reason why we have these big fires every year. Uh, there's just too many trees, too close together, and uh, with the drought, they're, they're just too dry. And is there any headway being made? Are they making any progress on any of that 2.4 million acres? They haven't started work uh, on any of the, the treatment uh, under four, uh, four forests. They've done some early work up around uh, Sholo and uh, Alpine under something called the White Mountain, White Mountain Stewardship Project. Uh, four forests will get underway uh, a, a little bit down the road here. They've They've now agreed on a contract with the private uh, uh, entity that will be involved. And so once that is put in place, uh, you know, in, in the next few, uh, two or three years, they should be able to actually get out, out on the ground and start figuring out w where they'll start and uh, get some of the, the, the first acreage treated. Now, are there any forests in the state that might be in good shape to be able to withstand the ravages of fire? I've heard that perhaps on the San Carlos Reservation, in the White Mountains, there may be some good work being done. There is, uh, there is definitely some areas where there's been some work happening. Uh, a couple of the, the Indian tribes have, have done some work. 
uh, the, the White Mountain Stewardship Project up in the White Mountains actually uh, did some, some thinning over the past few years. And that was very obvious during the Wallow Fire last year when uh, the, the flames were burning across some of the dense forests and that they got to those areas where the trees had been thinned and, and uh, the treatment had taken place and the fire dropped down and behaved a lot differently. And there are also a few areas up in the northwest part, uh, corner of the state where there's been some some uh, work done, some controlled burns, some other uh, some other work where the fire danger is maybe not as extreme as in other areas. Although with the dry conditions, the heat, the winds, uh, a fire that starts anywhere is is going to be difficult to get under control right away. Do you, do you know of any other big programs anywhere in the state that may be having an impact or could have an impact once they roll out? Four Forest is really the focus right now. It's what the Forest Service has, has put its efforts behind. Uh, the governor has uh, endorsed it and uh, made it a point in her state of the state this year that it needs to, to move forward. And it, it, it involves some of the uh, nonprofit environmental groups that have in the past had their differences with the Forest Service and some of the other uh, federal agencies. So th this is probably the best bet right now just because it has all of the different uh, players on the same page and working toward the same goals. And we have just about a minute remaining, Sean, and in that time, would you give us an update on what's going on with last year's huge fire, the Wallow Fire in the White Mountains, set a record at more than 500,000 acres. How's the recovery going there? They're learning more about what happened up there uh, as they've gone out, and, and there's been some early uh, work under some of the uh, the emergency type programs where they've gone out to try and reduce uh, the, the soil erosion to prevent flooding. They've gone out and taken a look at, at where they need to clear out some of the fallen fuels. So they're, they're moving ahead. It's a long and slow process. They'll, they'll do whatever they can to protect the communities in that area. And then over the years, they'll move uh, farther and farther into the, to some of the burned areas to try and figure out what they can do in terms of, of uh, salvage and, and restoration. But uh, it, it, they got underway almost immediately after the fire, and they've been working ever since. Sean McKinnon of the Arizona Republic, thanks so much for being with me. Glad to be here. That's our program for Friday, May 18th, 2012. Keep up with the state's wildfires, fire conditions, and all the latest news on our website, azpm.org. For Arizona Week, I'm Michael Chihak. Production of Arizona Week is made possible in part by a grant from the Stonewall Foundation and by the members of Arizona Public Media. Thank you for your continued support.